This podcast contains mature content, violence, and coarse language. It is intended for entertainment purposes only. Don't say we didn't warn you. Hi, my name is Madison, and you are listening to Who's Knocking, a true crime podcast. What up? This is my first episode back after the Christmas holiday. I had two weeks off. It was great. So many things happened during my Christmas holiday, okay? So much. I took a week or two weeks off from my newsletter, and, like, everything happened. They f- they caught the Idaho murderer. Hello? Uh, so if you are unaware of my – unaware – of my week, my weekly newsletter uh, called Grim Weekly. Sign up for that. Um, it comes out on Friday, so my first one of the year will be this Friday, and definitely, I'm sure it'll be all about the Idaho murderers, the Idaho murders, the Idaho murderer. What I don't know what we're saying now, but um, there's a lot of updates on that. I won't get into it now, but yeah, my last episode before the holiday was my. I did a episode on the John Benet Ramsey case in my humble opinion I believe that all the Ramseys are innocent and I laid out kind of why I thought that um so that was kind of a fun last episode and there's been some people chattering in the comments which is kind of cool um and I think I'll just get right into this episode this is gonna be a two-parter and um it's a pretty famous case this is serial killer case and that's all I will say before I get right into it. How's that for a short intro? There you go. So our story takes place in the beautiful state of Alaska. Now, Alaska by landmass alone is the largest state in America, but by population, it is the 47th largest state. So you have the biggest landmass with one of the smallest populations. So everybody's got a lot of room in Alaska. Uh, but I assume most of Alaska is really unhabitable. Unhabitable? I don't know how to say that. Anyway, Alaska boasts of beautiful oceans, coastlines, mountains, rainforest, and less bragworthy is their relatively high number of serial killers. Yes, Alaska has a shockingly high murder rate of about 10.8, meaning that almost 11 people are murdered per 100,000. Now, it's pretty high, definitely not the worst by any means, but considering its population size and general vibe, that's pretty high. I think it's it's more shocking because you kind of think of Alaska as like this very calm, peaceful place full of people who like peace and quiet and nature, but maybe that's just the type of environment that attracts serial killers, which Alaska has had their fair share of. There was Thomas Richard Bunday, not to be confused with Ted Bundy, uh, who killed five people in the 70s and 80s. There's James Dale Ritchie, who killed another five. And then who could forget the most infamous Anchorage serial killer, Old Israel Keys? I did an episode, or maybe two, on Israel Keys, so feel free to go check those out. Um, But yeah, that's a lot of killers in a place of that population size. Um... And they're not the only ones, and it's not just the rate of serial killers, it's just the rate of murder is high in general. But those are not who our story is about. Our story this week is about another Alaska serial killer, probably the most prolific. So I'm going to take you back to Alaska in the 1970s. Alaska in the 70s and 80s was a boomtown. Men flocked from all over the country to find work constructing the Alaska pipeline, which was, you know, a new big infrastructure in Alaska. So very quickly, Anchorage became a very male-heavy population, and that created the demand for prostitution, as it does. And we're specifically talking about younger, either single or away from their family, blue-collar workers or low-skill workers. Um, So this is just the type, not to say that there are not other types of men who enjoy prostitution, but you know, these men want some women. Uh, so it's unsurprising that it didn't take very long for a lot of young women from all over to flock to Anchorage, Alaska to work in one of the many strip clubs or topless bars or just straight up be a sex worker. Things were pretty easy going. AIDS was not a huge scare yet. Um, and there was a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of men, um, 
making decent money and they wanted to spend it on some ladies. Uh, so when 17 year old Cindy Paulson, also known in the streets as Kitty Larson, picked up a short little fella with a face full of acne scars and a stutter, there was no glaring sign telling her not to go off with this man. And so she did. Now, it was Sunday, June 13th, 1983, and Kitty had been working at Fifth and Denali, which was the spot where all the ladies of the night worked, smack in the middle of Anchorage, Alaska. Now, Cindy had been on and off the streets, and she was about 12 years old, so she was not a stranger to that lifestyle. She'd been a sex worker most of the time. She was always working for a pimp who'd lured her into his grips with gifts and promises. She was very young and she was very beautiful. And so it was often the case that she was the number one girl for whoever she was working for, which you can you can definitely see in the kind of like pimp prostitute relationship. The pimps, you know, create this like, they lure the men with this like, with like cars and clothes and whatever and then they like kind of rank them and create a little hierarchy which you know keeps people in line you know it's like if you're always the number one girl you're gonna want to stay because like that's a status thing you know it's that kind of whole thing anyway she was she was the number one girl um and yeah, she, she kind of was living her life kind of always at the mercy of, of other people, of the pimps or the Johns or the police. And um, that was how she was living her life. But she, she was also street smart and she was no fool. She, was, she did seem to have a kind of like naive immaturity and like childishness to her. But she had lived on the streets or like, you know, in the realm of prostitution since she was 12 years old. So she, you know, she's a tough gal so she gets in this man's car and uh you know he was like yeah we'll go to a hotel and as soon as she got in the car the man handcuffed her to the door and pulled out a gun and so she's like fuck this is not good she had agreed to go to a motel with him but this man wanted to take her to his home which is something that you know all the girls on the street knew not to do that's not a safe thing to do Um, but he insisted and he handcuffed her and put a gun in her face. So she had no choice. When they arrived at this man's family home, he dragged her into the basement. Cindy begged and pleaded with the man. She offered to do whatever he wanted if he would let her go, but he didn't let her go. And he raped Cindy in his basement. And he was quite weird about it, she says, and kind of kept demanding her to tell him that she wanted it. And he would be like, tell me you want it gross and she didn't because she didn't and he finished very quickly and when he did Cindy asked if she could use the bathroom and uh, she was hoping that she'd be able to figure out a way to escape through the bathroom the man did allow her to go to the bathroom but he put a big rope over her neck uh, like he tied a rope around her neck with the rope so he basically had her on what was essentially a dog leash while she went to the bathroom and the window was nailed shut anyway so there was no escape from that bathroom now once she got out of the bathroom um, he was fiddling around with some chains outside and she was like terrified and she's like okay I, I just have to get out of here she tried refusing his demands and he told her that she better cooperate and then she did not cooperate She yelled and she screamed, but unfortunately, it was no use. This man had gathered a big, long, heavy chain, and he used it to tie Cindy to a big wooden post in this basement. He tied her up, and he told Cindy that he was tired and he needed to sleep, so he put on the TV for Cindy very nicely. He gave her a blanket, and he left her tied up to the post while he slept for five hours. So Cindy sat or stood tied to that post for five hours I just cannot stress enough how horrific that would be having just been raped and tied up in a creepy man's basement and then just being left there for who knows how long just sitting and waiting for your death that's horrific terrifying she was very positive that this 
was going to be it and that she was going to die. There was no way he would let her go now. Like, he, he she'd seen his face, he raped her, and now she was being held captive. So she just couldn't fathom a way that she wasn't going to die. She knew she was going to die. As she stood there, chained to the wooden post for five hours, she had a good chance to look around the room and really take in the space in detail. There was um, a big pool table. There was a rack full of women's clothing, um, presumably his wife's clothing. But what stood out the most were the myriad of hunting trophies everywhere. There were hides and pelts and taxidermy heads and trophies This man was clearly an avid hunter, which scared the shit out of her because what do hunters do? They kill prey. And that seemed kind of exactly what he was doing to Cindy. Finally, after the five long hours, the man woke up and he told her he wasn't going to hurt her. He told her that he'd taken other girls for one week at a time and he said like, don't worry, like I really like you, so I'm going to treat you really nicely which she knew was bullshit. He claimed, like, his, when she was like, why are you doing this? His his claim was that he wanted to get his money's worth. Like, he had paid for prostitutes before, and he felt really cheated when he would, like, go to a motel, and they would have sex for a very short amount of time, because, as we know, he doesn't, he can't last very long, apparently. They made that very clear in the book that I read. And, um... Then the girl would leave and he felt this was not fair. He wanted to get his money's worth, so he would he claimed that he would hold girls for a week, have get what he wanted out of them for a week, and that was fair for whatever he decided to pay them. Which is just outrageous, but whatever, that was what he was claiming. Um Cindy understood from this story that this man must have killed the other women because Who the hell would let him get away with this? You can't just, you don't, nobody just locks up a woman for a week and like rapes her for a week and then just gets away with it. There was no way that that was the case. So she was now sure that he was killing people and that she was next. So he then told her that he was going to take her up to his cabin in his airplane and have his way with her there in his cabin in the woods that he claimed that he had. And he also made sure to mention that he had friends who would, uh, alibi him who would say that he was with him at the time so if she because he was still telling her that she was going to be let go eventually and so he said you know if if you ever say anything to anyone no one's going to believe you because I will have an alibi um so then he dragged Cindy upstairs and had her lay in the back seat of his car which was waiting inside the garage so she didn't have to she at first she was like okay when when he takes me from the house to the car I'm gonna bolt she couldn't do that because the car was in the garage so she lay in the back of the car handcuffed trying her hardest to come up with an escape plan she already had her shoes off she knew like the second that she could she would try to run but it was trying to find that opportunity so the man drove right into the airport right up beside his little plane I guess it was like you know a a small it's like a small airport it's the Merrill airport in Anchorage and I guess there's like um you know, a section for people who have their own little planes. So he drove his car right up to his plane. And um, he, while she was laying in the backseat of the car, he started taking stuff from the trunk to the airplane. All of his things. I don't know what he had, like hunting equipment or whatever. Um, And as he did this, he left the driver's side door open. Uh, I think the driver's front seat door. And so Cindy saw this and she knew that this was her chance. So she waited until he was like as as far away from the car as possible. And she just flung herself out. I guess she went kind of like through the front seat and around and flung herself out and booked it. She ran as fast as she could. She was barefoot on the gravel. So I'm sure her feet got completely wrecked, but she ran and ran. And the man saw this and he started chasing her and he... He had some short little legs, so I guess he wasn't as fast as her and maybe a little less motivated. Um, But she ran and ran until she got to a used car lot. She was able to hide behind a car until she was able to flag down a truck. Now, the truck almost did not stop for her, but as like it started to pass her and she just screamed. And so the guy pulled over and let her in. And fucking man is like right behind her, like enough that the truck driver could see 
and but he took off and he's like what the hell and she's like he's trying to kill me blah 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 she had the handcuffs on the truck driver wanted to take her right to the police station but Cindy refused she just wanted to be dropped off at the timber motel which was where she was living with her pimp at the time and she basically convinced him to do this to drop her off at the timber motel instead of the police station when she got there this pimp of hers had no idea what to do with her. She was completely hysterical. She was handcuffed. He tried to calm her down, and it was no use. She was, you know, terrified, as one would be. Now, as I said, Cindy did not want to go to the police station, but the truck driver did go to the police station, as any good Samaritan would. He reported exactly what happened which is how the police knew to come to the Timber Motel to find Cindy, still hysterical and still handcuffed. She did cooperate with them. She told them everything that happened in detail, and her story was very believable. So they tracked down this guy, and he was identified as Robert Hansen, a local baker who had a great reputation in the community. A little bit odd, but he owned a bakery, and he had a stutter, and he wasn't exactly threatening looking. They interviewed Robert, and he denied everything. He even gave an alibi, which was corroborated by multiple friends, more upstanding men of the community. And they all said that he was with them that night. They gave a very detailed account, and it, you know there was no way to question it. Remember, this is 70s and 80s, so there's no CCTV. There's nothing to like solidly alibi people except the word of these men so after hearing this the police had a problem it was now the word of a 17 year old prostitute against a local baker and all of his other friends who were not doing illegal things for work so who do you think people were going to believe the men of course Still leaning towards believing Cindy, they asked her to take a polygraph test, and then she refused, which I do not blame her for because polygraph tests are stupid. But after that, they kind of felt like they were at a loss, and the case just kind of went cold, and Robert Hansen was not apprehended, and he went about his business, and, you know, Cindy left. She was, it was presumed that she had lied about the whole thing. Why she would lie about that, don't know. But Robert just went back to his life. Cindy, on the other hand, knew that her life was in danger in Anchorage, so she got the fuck out of there. And I believe she went on to Seattle, but, you know, we don't know that at this time. And this all kind of comes to a head on September 12, 1982. Two off-duty police officers were out enjoying some nature and some time off, and they were looking to hunt some moose. But instead, they stumbled upon the shallow grave of a dead woman on the Nick River sandbar about 25 miles north of Anchorage. This area had very little foot traffic. It was super remote and probably only accessible by boat or airplane. It was obvious from the state of decomposition that the body had definitely been buried for some time. There was a single... 223 caliber shell casing from a rifle found very nearby sorry if i um am talking like if i sound stupid talking about guns i really don't know anything about guns but a point two two three caliber hit me up in the comments if you know anything um so a, a 223 caliber shell casing found nearby and there was also an ace bandage in the mix which led people to believe that she had been blindfolded at some point so an ace, ace bandage I guess, I think Ace is the brand, um, but it's just like a, you know, long bandage, kind of like a tensor bandage um, that you would wrap around like your elbow or your knee if uh, you had an injury or whatever. And that was just kind of found with her. Um, and she didn't have an injury that would have required a bandage like that. And I think that's why they assumed that, you know, she had been blindfolded and murdered. Now, the autopsy revealed that she had died of gunshot wounds, duh, and that she had been dead for about six months. It took until September 27th to identify this person as Sherry Morrow. Now, Sherry was 23 years old, and she worked as a topless dancer at a bar downtown called Wild Cherry Bar. It also seemed that she did some sex work on the side, and she had gone missing in November of 1981. 
In 81, Morrow had been reported missing by her boyfriend after she failed to show up for a doctor's appointment. The day before the appointment, she had told a girlfriend of hers that she had scheduled a meetup with a man who had offered to pay her $300 for some sort of photo shoot. Now, this was obviously an unusually large sum of money for pictures or really any sort of prostitution meetup. Um, and after that, she was never heard from again. Now, they had the one dead dancer, and they had also at least three women reported missing since 1980. And in a city of 150,000 people, that's a lot. All of the missing women were sex workers, and now one of them had been found dead. It was very possible that they had some sort of predator on their hands. Um, and so, like, there was, there was three, like, that they really thought were missing. I'm sure there was a number, and the number would continue to grow, um, that were just like a little bit more sketchy that they probably thought they had been, that they had run away on, or maybe they were not reported. Um, but three pretty solid cases. The police began talking to sex workers and they created this list of men that some of the local girls had run into problems with. It was not an easy task though, because a lot of the men in Anchorage, as I said before, were quite transient. Most of them young and single or else had left their families to go work in Alaska. And it was possible that somebody had come through, fucked some shit up, and then was already long gone. At the time as well, the Green River Killer was also at large in Seattle and going after this exact type of victim. And they kind of played around with thinking that the cases may have been related or somebody kind of going from Seattle to Anchorage, who knows? The situation was definitely on police radar, but it wasn't something that they were, like, crazy concerned about yet. It was a year later, and again in September, but this time of 1983, that a second body was found, again on the Nick River, and very close to where they had found Sherry Morrow. Now, this body, again, was found very decomposed in a shallow grave. She was wearing blue jeans with the fly completely undone, and her sweater and bra had been cut down the middle. They also found an identical shell casing to one found near Sherry Morrow. This autopsy on this victim concluded that she was in her early to mid-20s and had been shot through the sternum and into her heart. Now, this discovery told the investigators that they did indeed have a predator on their hands and that this was a serial killer and he was hunting sex workers. Now, it took about one month to identify this body, and that was of 30-year-old Paula Golding of Kona, Hawaii. Now, Paula was last seen heading on a date with a man who had offered her $200 and told her that she needed to take a cab. Paula was very new to sex work, and according to her friend and roommate, she probably didn't have her guard up as much as a lot of the other more experienced ladies. After identifying Paula, the FBI was able to match the 223 shell casing found near her body to the other shell casing found with Sherry Morrow. Something that they noticed as well when it came to all of these shell casings was that it looked like whoever was killing these women were reloading their own ammunition. Now, like I just said, I am not at all knowledgeable with guns. I did try to look into exactly what this means, and what I gathered from my research is that it's basically like making your own bullets or remaking your own bullets. Um, and by loading the shells with like maybe your own gunpowder or ammo or whatever. And reasons one might do this is either to save money, um, because it's cost slightly less, especially if you're using a lot of bullets. Um, but also if you want to be really specific about the type of ammunition you want to create, you can kind of specialize your ammo by, I guess, mixing certain things or something. Um, people who know a lot more about this, please feel free to give a better explanation in the comments. But what's important is that this is outside of the norm, reloading your own ammunition. Most people just buy their own ammo and use it. So... This would prove to be a big clue in linking the cases. Now, the girls continued to go missing, and police were forced to try to get on top of it. Sergeant Glenn Floth was assigned to the case, and he 
got to work going through all of the missing persons cases and creating a list of girls with similar traits. Floth initially identified seven women who seemed to fit a pattern. And this was Paula Golding, age 30, from Hawaii, reported missing on April in April of 1983. Kathy Disher, 23, who disappeared in late 1982. Delyn Frey, age 20, reported missing September 1983. Karen Bombsgard, 24, from Portland, Oregon. Sue Luna, 23, from Washington State. Teresa Watson, 22, from Sacramento, California. And Angela Federn, 26, from Seattle, Washington. Now, all of these girls were in, and or, in or around their 20s or appeared to be, all between 5'4 and 5'7 with slim builds and bigger boobs. All of them had at one time worked as topless dancers in Anchorage and all had dates with a random guy who offered them an unusually large sum of money for their services before they disappeared. As Glenn Floth got further into his investigation, he had a chat with one of his superiors, Major Gilmore. Now, Floth had told him about Robert Hansen. He uh, obviously knew about the whole uh, Sidney Paulson thing. And even though he'd been alibied, he just couldn't get over cindy's story he really believed her and her story was so detailed and there was no plausible reason for her to make up such an outlandish tale he really thought this had to be related and he was really looking into robert hansen now with that information robert gilmore was reminded of a case from 1971 it was christmas day when an 18 year old woman was found frozen to death in McHugh creek park now she was found naked from the waist down and her wrists were bound behind her back with speaker wire she'd clearly been sexually assaulted and her chest had been slashed with a knife from where she was found it was believed that she was she had been able to escape her attacker but then she ended up freezing to death hiding behind a bush the woman was melanie michaels and she'd been missing for three days before she had been found her brothers thought that she was babysitting that night, and so they didn't report her missing until the next day. There were quite a few suspects in the case. Um, there were all the brothers, the people that she was going to babysit for, uh, maybe a boyfriend or two, and it was difficult to narrow down. One of the other officers uh, in helping out with this case decided that he uh, needed his daughter to come forward and tell her story because he really thought that it could be related. Now, uh, he was very reluctant because his, his daughter was a sex worker and obviously there was a lot of shame involved in that. Now, this girl, her name was Robert pa Robin Patterson. And what she had to say was pretty awful and seemed very related to the story of Melanie Michaels. So Melanie told Major Gilmore that at the time she had been uh, out working near a very sleazy cafe, a very known hotspot for prostitution, and she claimed that she had been kidnapped at gunpoint out in the parking lot by a man who she described exactly the same way that uh, Cindy Paulson had described Robert Hansen. Shorter, acne scarred, and talked with a stutter. She said that he tied her hands behind her back with shoelaces and then stripped her of her clothes and brought her to a motel where he raped her. Robin described him as having a very weird looking penis. Shorter, but very wide. Gross. After he finished with her, he put her in the car, telling her that he would take her home, but instead driving deeper and deeper into the woods. Robin was very certain that this man was going to kill her. It seemed like he was going to. She said that she begged him to let her go, promising that she would never go to the police. And miraculously, he ended up agreeing to this and he drove her back to where he found her, which is just shocking. But remember, this is, this happened in 71 or before. So this was years before, uh, we, we, I'm kind of guessing this was like in the beginning of his killings. Um, but anyway, he dropped her off. And um, even though Major Gilmore believed what Robin had to say, most of the other officers at the time did not, especially after he provided some sort of alibi again. 
And other suspects in the Melanie Michaels case remained kind of at the top of their list. So again, the only thing that took the suspicion off of Hansen was his alibi and then uh, for the Robin case and then for the Melanie Michaels case, he wasn't even a suspect because there were so many other men surrounding her that they just decided that they were suspects. So uh, Robert Hansen was kind of forgotten about and it wasn't until Glenn Floth brought him back up that Major Gilmore remembered all of us and kind of started thinking about it and piecing it together. So I think now is a good time to tell you a little bit more about our friend Robert Hansen. So Robert Hansen was born on February 15th, 1939 in Esterville, Iowa. He was the oldest of two boys who were born to their American mother, Adna Margaret Peterson, and their Danish immigrant father named Christian Hansen. Um, And they would end up settling in Pocahontas, Idaho. Not Idaho, Iowa. So Christian was a baker by trade and he ran his own bakery and Robert had to spend a lot of time working at his father's bakery as a child and it seemed like he wasn't a huge fan of that. He didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't about the baking lifestyle, but he kind of had to because his dad made him. Robert did not have a great relationship with his father. Chris Hansen was very hard on him. He was very strict. He was a very black and white type of guy like it was his way or the highway um so you know not super enjoyable if you are the son of somebody like that when Robert first began writing his parents discovered that he was left-handed and at that time that was super uncool couldn't couldn't have that so his father forced him to switch to using his right hand and I assume that it was you know by physical punishment that they were able to do that many mental health professionals over the years have blamed his stutter on this switching his his writing hand um i'm a little skeptical of anyone who can be that sure and specific but all right now as robert got older his father trained him in the bakery and chris hansen was adamant that his son would follow him in his footsteps but chris was extremely critical of his son and often disparaged him now I'm going to read, so I, I don't think I even mentioned, but for this episode, I my main source was this book. It's called Butcher Baker, The True Account of an Alaskan Serial Killer by Walter Gilmore and Leland Hale. Um, I'm just going to read a little passage where Robert is describing himself in, um, in high school. Quote, and this is Robert Hansen talking, quote, if you look real close at my face, you'll see that I used to have a tremendous amount of pimples on my face all through high school and even all through service. It embarrassed me to no end to even be around people. My speech was another thing. My gosh, I looked like a freak and I sounded like one. I never had many girls that were interested in me when they can go out with some guy that can at least talk to them halfway intelligently and not be with a pimple face. They would sure rather do that. I can probably count on one hand the number of dates I had through high school. I was always so embarrassed and upset by people making fun of me that I hated the word school. I guess that is why I burned down the bus barn. I just hated that place with a divine passion. I would do anything and everything I could to get back at that monster school that I convinced myself was out to do Bob Hansen personal wrong. End quote. And I'll get to the the bus incident, you'll see. I think it's reasonable to conclude that this harsh relationship contributed to Robert's very low self-esteem, especially when paired with his severe acne and stutter. Not surprisingly, Robert was not popular in high school and he considered himself an outcast and was bullied quite a bit. As he mentioned in that quote, he did have a, a, a stint in the in the U.S. Army Reserve uh, for one year and uh, he was a successful marksman. He was... And you'll see he's he's a very good marksman. Um, but that's what he did. I don't know why he, I think he just ended it and came back to be a baker. But it's easy to see how Robert grew very resentful of the kids in the community around him at school. And in particular, the girls who were never interested in him. He seemed like quite, well, he would now be an incel. His upbringing and his life as an adolescent were the fuel that kind of led him to his first documented act of violence, which I will get to now. 
1961, at age 22, Robert Hansen set fire to a local bus barn with another boy just to see if he could get away with it. And as you saw from that quote, what really uh, motivated him to do that was like his hatred of the school. The bus barn, I think, was like where they kept the school buses. Um, So he planned this whole event in advance. He acquired a bunch of gas. He set up an alibi for himself and his accomplice by uh, going and completing some task at the bakery that evening and, you know, saying that they were there the whole evening and I guess they were each other's alibi. They didn't invite another boy to be involved in this, but he didn't end up showing up. Um, And they also did this on a night that the local high school was playing a basketball game, so practically the entire town was occupied. So... They did this, and they successfully lit a fire and burned the bus barn down. And it it was a huge thing. Uh, They watched as the firefighters came and and put it all out, and everyone was all up in arms. They didn't know who did it. Obviously, it was arson. And it really seemed like they were going to get away with this until uh, the accomplice was ratted out by somebody at a party who he had told, and then he quickly rolled over on Robert, and Robert was arrested. Now, even though Robert was arrested and charged with the crime, the whole town was pretty divided about who had actually done it. Robert was claiming that he didn't do it. Uh, At the time, he was engaged to be married to a woman named Phoebe Paget, And Phoebe... Phoebe was a very plain girl. Um, It seemed like he just, like, kind of wanted to marry somebody and, like, picked the only person who could, like, kind of liked him. Um, And this was Phoebe. Um, she was adamant that Robert was innocent, but she did make a promise to her skeptical family that if it was proven that Robert was responsible, that she would leave him and call off the wedding. And when it was proven that he did, she did call off the wedding. But it turned out that Robert's accomplice and the other guy who had been invited but didn't go to the fire party, um, they both testified against him and told authorities exactly what happened. Robert's father was very upset about this. He had been adamant to anybody who would listen that his son was innocent and that he was being railroaded by the cops. And he had the backing of a lot of the other small business owners in town who like kind of usually had each other's backs, like they were kind of in a like an alliance situation. Um, but in the end, Robert Hansen did plead guilty while maintaining his innocence to his family and friends or whoever would listen to him. Um, but he was sentenced to three years in the state reformatory. Now, six months into his sentence, he did end up confessing that he was responsible for the fire. And that is when Phoebe finally ended the engagement. And uh, Chris Hansen, his father, who had been sticking by his son and was convinced that he was being set up, uh, got really upset. So upset by Robert's confession that he actually sold his bakery and moved away to Minnesota. In shame. So that's how that ended, and he got out and moved on with with his life, and he ended up going to Minnesota with his family, and the next brush with the law didn't occur until 1971, and it was alleged that Robert had followed a woman home, and when she made it clear that she didn't want him there, he left, but then a week later, he came back, and he tried to abduct her at gunpoint. Now, this woman screamed and ran away, and she was able to get away, thank goodness. And so she reported this whole incident to the police. Um, He did end up getting taken in and charged. Um, The DA, though, got Robert to agree to a plea deal. He pled guilty to the assault charge in exchange for dropping the kidnapping charge. And Robert only served three months before he was moved to a halfway house where he was then placed on work release. And during his work release and living in the halfway house, he was able to see his wife and children and pretty much live a decently normal life. And then in November of 1973, he was paroled. So the whole thing was basically a slap on the wrist for what seemed like it could have been a pretty horrific crime. He stalked this woman, assaulted her, and tried to kidnap her. So that is you know that's not good in 1977 Hansen stole a chainsaw from a store he was caught in the act and charged with larceny and he was sentenced to five years in prison for this although within one year he appealed that conviction and again was placed on probation and released so again another little slap on the wrist 
However, while he was serving time, he was diagnosed by a mental health professional as bipolar and he was prescribed lithium, although he was not required to take it by law. So very quickly he stopped taking it. And that was everything that he kind of, like he served time for, everything that he got in trouble for and it they followed through. Um, but Glenn Floth began to also uncover many instances where he was accused of violent crimes but was never charged. So we have the Robert Patterson thing. Um, and then in 1975, there was another incident where he kidnapped and raped another topless dancer, allegedly. Mm. He scared the shit out of her and she never said anything about it. Later, she did identify him to a rape counselor. She ID'd his photos as well as his red Volvo and license plate number. And all of that came back to Robert Hansen. But the problem in this case was that the woman refused to identify herself. She was now a school teacher and she feared both Robert and the school board. Uh, she didn't want them to find out that she had done sex work in her past, which I understand. Um, so when interviewed about the incident, Robert denied the whole thing. He said that he had met that girl at the Kit Kat Club, which I guess was a topless bar or a strip club, whatever. And he said that he was taking her home. And she said it would cost $100. And he thought that that was way too expensive. So he just, without arguing, very kindly returned her back to the club. Yeah, fucking right. She says that he violently raped her and attempted to kidnap her, but she ended up getting away. And we will get, uh, we will get to more accusations in a little bit. Now, Floth knew that if he wanted to convince the DA that Hansen was their guy for these two murder cases. So after digging up all of this on Robert Hansen, he was starting to really suspect him for the murders. Uh, he had the, the Cindy Paulson incident, which he really believed that Robert was responsible for. Um, he had the cases where he actually went to prison, his, so his actual criminal record, and then all these alleged cases where it really looked like he, he did some shady shit. But Floth knew that if he wanted to convince the DA that Hansen was their man and that they could really convict him, that they needed every scrap of evidence that they could find. So he dug deep. As stealthily as he could, so as not to tip off Robert, he began poking around in Robert's life. Based on the larceny charge and the post-conviction mental health evaluations, he guessed that Robert was some sort of kleptomaniac, and he began looking into cabin robberies in the area, including situations that may have involved an airplane, so not necessarily in the Anchorage area, but outside. He talked to people that Robert hunted with and tried to figure out what his style was, and how he liked to go about hunting. And it turned out that Robert held a number of world record titles for bow and arrow hunting, and he had a very accurate shot at very long ranges. He was a very proficient hunter. Now, would you be surprised to hear that throughout all of this, Robert was a married man with two children? I was not shocked. So, Bob had met Darla Henrichson, one summer while they were both working on a lake resort that Robert's parents owned in Minnesota. Remember they moved away out of sheer embarrassment after Robert confessed to setting the fire? Well, they opened up a lake resort in Minnesota and they let their criminal son work there. Um, and then Darla was also working there and they hit it off and they spent the entire summer together. They were a bit of an odd couple, but they did make sense. Darla had always been very tall and awkward, and like Robert, she was very unpopular in high school. Boys were not interested in her. And she was at least a head taller than all the boys. So that's the main reason they didn't take to her very well. I think she had a sister who was very popular. So she was, you know, not, that wasn't thrilling to Darla, I guess. But anyway, the pair discovered that they were both from the same town in Iowa. And they even had went to the same school and attended the same church. What a coincidence. My guess is that Robert wasn't super thrilled about Darla. Uh, he obviously would have loved to be with some sort of beautiful woman that he thought that he deserved, but he knew that he could never attain one. Uh, but he knew that Darla would be obedient and unsuspecting, and if he were ever planning to do any of the things that he was later planning to do, I think that he knew he would probably 
it, it would be easier to get away with that type of shit if he had a wife and a, like a normal looking family um and he thought that darlo it would be easy to get away with whatever he wanted with darla um yeah i think i think this was just a convenience thing for him yeah i think i i, I kind of get the vibe that Robert knew he could never get a woman that he really wanted. So he knew that he would have to like just take what he wanted. Um, and having just like a plain obedient wife would be a really good cover. That seems to be a pattern in a lot of these a lot of these serial killer men. That's smart. I'll give you that. So the pair were married uh, very soon after that summer. And Darla dropped out of school and the couple decided to move to Anchorage, Alaska, Robert's idea. There, Darla continued her education and she became a special education teacher, which is something she was very passionate about and very good at. I think many people believe that Darla's innate desire to help and care for others kind of led her to Robert and also kept her from seeing the truth. I think she, you know, she saw this like little man with acne scars and a stutter, like he kind of seemed like a wounded bird to her and she was like, oh, I can fix this, great. Red flag, ladies. Darla always seemed like, yeah, uh, seemed like she felt that she could fix Robert. She knew that when he took off for entire weekends or was out late at night, um, that he was probably up to no good. She assumed that he was out with prostitutes, which he was. And she thought that by dragging him to church on Sundays that this could lead him to Jesus Christ, who would eventually put him on a better path. Does that ever work? No. But poor Darla did did think that that was a good plan. And Darla wasn't clueless. She had met him after his first arson charge. She was there for the chainsaw incident and the assault charges, but she stayed with him through all of that. Darla had a very strong Christian faith, and because of that, she really prioritized obeying her husband. Because of this, she put up with his obvious infidelities, his fits of rage, his multiple stints in jail. I kind of have a lot of sympathy for poor Darla, but I mean, you guys, like, there's a lesson here. You, you just can't, you just can't let these guys get away with whatever the hell they want. So I think this is a good place to end part one. We now know what we suspect Robert of doing, what Robert has definitely done, and a little bit about his backstory and life. I think this is like one of the most, he, he's got like a very classic serial killer story. And it's not shocking to see where this leads. Um, but I will end it here. Um... Thank you so much for listening. I hope you tune in next week. Um, we have been doing some upgrades on everything. We got a bit of a new audio setup, and I think we're going for a new video thing. We've got a couple of things in the works. I'm hoping to do some more little knockers soon, some little YouTube shorts and stuff like that. So please look out. Please feel free to... Uh, comment and subscribe and like our videos that would be really great um i think that's all for me so check us out on instagram at who's knocking podcast twitter at who's knocking pod sign up for my newsletter at grimweekly.com and please stay safe out there because you never know who's knocking This podcast is produced in collaboration with Lost Line Media. Artwork by August Digital. Music by Matthew Cook.